Are we recording, Mitzi? Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, I should say. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this month's uh, iteration of the author series presented by the PCOM Library. I am Kevin Bradford, your MC, uh, the Research and Writing Support Librarian here at, at, uh, at PCOM. Uh, this month's speaker, this is a bi-monthly series, so uh, we will be having a talk again in April, but for this month, uh, we have Dr. Joan Nadorf speaking to us on her book. Dr. Nadorf is a board-certified emergency physician trained at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. She practiced for nearly 30 years in the busy emergency departments of Inova Alexandria Hospital and Fort Belvoir Community Hospital in Virginia. As an author and speaker, she's been sharing important ideas with students, residents, and practicing physicians through various online and direct engagements. Dr. Nadoff was recently appointed to the editorial advisory board of the DO Magazine. Her proudest accomplishment has been raising three compassionate and intelligent children along with her devoted husband, Tobe. In her spare time, Dr. Nadoff enjoys reading, traveling, playing tennis, and walking with Dolly, the miniature poodle. And without further ado, Dr. Nadorf, go ahead and share your screen. Welcome again, Dr. Nadorf. All right, hi everybody. I'm really glad that you're all here with me today. And um, I hope to share uh, some insight into the process of how I got this book published. And to start us off, uh, I'll ask Dr. Nader uh, uh, to, to launch right in and describe to us her thought processes behind the conception and writing of her book. Okay, so I graduated in 85. I did uh, four years of training. Um, I did a rotating internship. I did a year of internal medicine at Albert Einstein, and then I did emergency medicine residency. And when I came out, I took a job as an attending physician in Alexandria Hospital, and, uh, which is in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, what I noticed pretty soon afterwards was that I had a problem. I loved emergency medicine. Uh, I loved trying to get people to feel better. I loved interacting with my colleagues and most of the patients. But what I found out was that there was a problem with some patients. Uh, it seemed like there were difficult patients that um, came every shift, N not the same people every shift, although some, that is a problem too, that some people would come all the time. And uh, I d decided to do some research. At the time, I was on the faculty of uh, George Washington University Medical Center, a medical school, and I decided to do the research on the problem and give a talk for Grand Rounds. Uh, there was some excellent literature about it. The, the, the primary uh, piece of literature, and I talk about this in the book as well, is, was an article by Dr. James Groves, who was a psychiatrist at Mass General, and he talked about the four classifications of what he called hateful patients uh, that we would see in a medical practice. And this is really useful information because uh, what I learned from doing the research was that there are a lot of typical fears and behaviors that we would see in our patients. And uh, in addition to that, the physicians and nurses would have very typical, what I call thought distortions, that they would think about people uh, in a certain way and we would label the people as difficult. So we have, every one of us has some idea in our head of what the definition of a good patient is. And when patients do not conform to that instruction manual or that instruction book for what a good patient is, we label them as difficult. And once we label someone as difficult, we find evidence to support that belief. So I worked on uncovering that and I gave a talk. Um, there are some tools and with some practice that I discovered we could improve our thoughts. What I discovered is that we had a ton of negative thoughts. And the negative thoughts were mainly for three reasons. First of all, 
we all have a negative thought bias as we're kind of trained to look for the worst possible diagnosis and look at things in the worst possible way looking for danger that's the first thing the second thing is that basically we're taught that way um, we hear some of the very derogatory words while we're training from our senior residents uh, in the break room uh, on my experience was mostly in the emergency department and uh, I think the third reason is that we kind of mock or make fun of our patients, kind of a gallows humor to lighten uh, the mood in the department. But all that comes around to having really negative thoughts about our patients. And uh, what I discovered is that if with some tools and some practice, you can actually change the way we think about our negative patients and feel a whole lot better about these interactions. Um, so I gave a talk, and, and this is a, a, before my kids are born, I'm gonna say 1991 or 92. My department chairman liked it so much, he asked me to give it again the next year, which I did. And then I put it aside, and I had three kids in two years. I was super, super busy, and um, I didn't think about it again. I incorporated those ideas into my own practice. I wasn't perfect at it, but I tried. and. Um, up until um, a couple of years ago, um, I decided to, uh, I, I was, by that time, I had stopped practicing in the emergency department. I had a non-clinical job for a while. In um, 2018, that job went away with reduction in force for that company. And I decided that I wanted to go back to that topic and expand it and start giving a lecture to um, residents. So I reached out to my chief, John Becker. Um, he, I lectured to physicians at the Emergency Medicine Conference. I reached out to Vic Scali and Sandy Nairn, who's at Cooper. Um, and I, came, I gave those lectures and some other ones um, to the residents. And that helped me kind of um, broaden the topics that I was speaking on and get back into this topic a lot more. And I got a really positive feedback at the same time, I started doing some more writing that was printed in spots like Doxivity. Um, and I decided in December, uh, well, I saw, I saw some friends at um, a conference and one of my girlfriends, Elaine Lombardi-Wilk, decided, uh, she told me, I think this is your thing, Joan, you should write a book. I had never even thought about that before. So I decided to dig up this lecture, which by the way, um, the only, I didn't have, wasn't on my computer any longer because that was from like 20 years ago. The only thing I had was a hard copy on pin-fed paper. And probably most of you don't even know what pin-fed paper is, but this is what we had before laser printers. Um, so I went back, adopted it, add more research. And what I found is a lot of the kind of new research in habit change was very relevant because a lot of what we do about our thinking about our negative patients is actually just a bad habit. Um, I set about this goal to try and write a manuscript and I took every few slides that I had and I would set it aside as a topic for a chapter and then I would um, decide that I would set as a goal to write one chapter a week and most of the chapters are about 1200 words maybe a little bit more so within uh, four months which was about march of um, 2021 um, i had 17 chapters which was about 30,000 words um, of course in the middle of that time uh, one of the little obstacles we had was that i brought home this our family decided to get a new dog um, and we brought home Dolly the Poodle in February of 2022, who's lovely um, girl, but high energy, not house trained. And I basically had to, this is move where I was writing from a nice office I had upstairs in one of my kids' bedrooms to the kitchen so I could keep an eye on her and take her outside when she needed to go out. And that's her lying, um, under the table at my feet when I'm working with my uh, laptop at the kitchen table. So uh, I was done in March and I had written a little piece about childhood influenza. I appeared on the podcast of Kevin Poe, 
His, pot, his uh, website is kevinmd.com. And he, he is one of the places, if, if those of you who like to write or blog can get your works published. And if you get your work published, he sets up a time for you that, to make available for you to appear on his podcast. So I appeared on Kevin's podcast in April. And I noticed when I was reading about him that he had published a book. And I asked him um, how he did that. And he said, you know what, I have a publisher and I'll introduce you to her. So he um, gave me the name of the publisher. Her name is Nancy Collins. She works with the American Association for Physician Leadership. And I, by April, I just decided, I asked a couple friends to read it. I didn't get much feedback. I just said, you know, I'm just going to send it to her and see what she says, um, whether I, and I would know whether I needed to throw it in the trash bin or self-publish. I wasn't expecting what I heard, which was she told me she wanted to um, take it to the next step, is what she called it. And um, that meant that within the next few weeks, and she had to run it through her editorial board, that uh, they offered me a contract to publish this book. What they came back to me with um, was that um, the, the book that I wrote was mainly um, set in the emergency department because that was my area of expertise. I like to call my zone of genius, um, tongue in cheek there. And um, I, they wanted me to expand the reach of the book to all medical professionals, DOs, MDs, RNs, PAs, APPs, alphabet soup, EMTs. I think it really re could reach and message needs to be heard by all uh, medical professionals who take care of patients. And there are a lot of them out there, a lot of, that I haven't mentioned. So I re totally rewrote it and rewrote some of the examples in the book to include um, you know, different settings of what would happen in, in a pediatric office or a family practice office, um, or at least what I would imagine would happen there. I hadn't worked in one in a long time. Um, I rewrote and improved my graphics. Um, and one thing that was added to the text, which was kind of cool, just to break up the text and to give some more interest, there are these drawings that were contributed by a graphic artist who worked for the publisher. Um, his name is Victor Crucianu. And he did these drawings, and it's called uh, continuous contour line drawings. And several of these appear throughout the text because what I talk about is the kind of snap judgments that we make, make on people and things. And sometimes seeing a picture is all that we need or, or a visual of a certain person to come up with a certain idea about what diagnosis they have or what kind of problems they have. and um, I, I found that the, I really like the drawings. I think it adds a lot to the book. Um, the, um, one of the questions that was asked to me was what was one of the hardest things about the book, um, about publishing the book. And I think that the, in the publishing process, one of the first things that um, the publisher asked me for was a, uh, author headshot and I found that to be one of the most challenging thing much more challenging than writing the book the book just kind of flowed out of me um, and I was pretty good about keeping to my schedule but to do an author headshot I had to kind of worry about my hair which is kind of naturally curly and any I don't normally wear makeup and I thought that would help a little bit for a picture so I'm sure um, you know, a, a lot of you will identify with this issue when someone tells you you have to have a, a nice picture, you're gonna like, hmm, how am I gonna do that? So I had a friend of a friend who's very good at this and did some, she does like senior portraits for people. And um, we did this, um, she came and took them in my backyard. This is one of the pictures that, with the scene I got in the white coat and a couple different outfits. I even have a few pictures um, with me holding Dolly, but um, those don't go on the book. Um, the other thing we had to do, which was kind of difficult, I wasn't anticipating, is that I'm sure many of you have seen books and they have blurbs or endorsements on the back cover or inside from a different author, different 
well known people and i had a problem that i didn't really know that many people i my network if you will the people that i trained with tend to be about my age was a little bit older some of them are retiring some of my friends were deans of the medical schools and program director so that was really helpful but i didn't know that many people not like anyone who's a household name and i just had to if i could find someone's email address i had to write total strangers and ask them to make the time to read the book. It's not a very long book. It probably takes a person about an hour and a half to read it. Um, and if they could, to write a few sentences or a short endorsement for me. And, um, and that would potentially go either on the back of the book or inside. And there's some super busy people who were very generous with their time and their words. And um, said yes that they would do that i think the the funniest came from um lewis profeta this is the um this is what he wrote but just the backstory on this i don't know him at all i wrote him an email he says a lot of people call me and ask me this every month and i have to see if i like it i said of course you know read it and see what you think and he responded to me about a week later and said i thought i wasn't going to like it but I love it. And I've already used some of the changes in my practice. And bear in mind, he's like super pro veteran uh, emergency physician. And he said, and it made me a better doctor. I said like, wow, that's amazing. Could you write that down? Um, so this is what um, Dr. Profeta wrote, which is um, really kind. And I've gotten a lot of other nice feedback, which has gone some of it on the back of the book and in the book. So um, that, you know, a few people could not do it and they said no, and they had too much on their plate. And I, of course, understood that. Uh, But that was one of the difficult parts um, because I also had to give them a timeline because I had to be in by like December 1st so that we could get it printed. And and we knew that the printing was, was kind of gonna go to the publisher at the end of December and be published pretty remarkable turnaround i think by the beginning um, by by the second week of january so this is now available on um at the website uh this is a picture of me um, opening the box of books and um this is what it looks like Um, i received it in the mail and i had my um put this out on the internet. Another challenging thing for me was I basically set up my own website, which is uh, drjoannadorf.com. If any of you would want to come visit me there, I have uh, some, a lot of blog posts. Uh, I've been writing about issues in emergency medicine. Some of the issues um, about dealing with difficult patients or changing how we think about difficult patients and um, of course i put pictures of dolly up so um, if those of you who are it's on amazon.com and it's also available through physicianleaders.org which is the publisher they have a coupon coupon code which gets you 15 percent off nador 15 i think all uppercase and they are planning an audio version which will not be narrated by me because you know i think we need a pro for that and my sweet new jersey accent is not exactly um, made for this purpose so um any other questions or things you want me to cover kevin uh thank you dr nader that that was great a nice practical uh, uh, hands-on review of your experience from conception to publishing of of your book and it it sounds like a great title too so thank you for uh, thank you for talking with us Uh, we'd like to open up the floor to our our attendees please feel free to unmute yourself uh, if you've got any questions for dr nador i'll just say one thing while uh, while folks are if they can think of any questions um it what i one of my only regrets is that, um, <laughs> thank you, Desiree. She's, Desiree says, I think I, I should narrate the book. <laughs> uh, 
I think what I might do as a teaser is narrate or make a, I don't know, a video or an audio or something of, of like read the introduction myself and uh, put it on like my website or something like that. Um, the only thing I regret was not keeping a journal while I was uh, practicing. And there are lots and lots of things that I remembered, but um, it's so hard. The, the really big things, of course, I remember, but um, some of the things, what's so crazy about what happens is that there are a lot of things happening at the same time. And that's the part you can't remember. And the kind of you're like, okay, this is life the way it is right now. Um, you know, three or four people in a row that have these kind of zany uh, chief complaints and um, that kind of contribute to the humor of the situation. I wish I had journaled at the time. And I think that a lot of you um, may be interested in journaling or blogging. Um, and if you have any pieces that you want to contribute, since I, I do have this association now with the DO magazine and I asked one of the editors there um, if you write a story or some sort of opinion piece that you would like to you know see if the magazine would like to publish this was who you would uh, submit it to the the DO at osteopathic.org so um, they're trying to have I, I I don't know if you're aware but um, um, the uh, I'll, I'll answer that question in one moment um they're trying the in february they're launching an all do written magazine it has been <coughs> have contributed to it but and, and they have a professional staff who are wonderful and um i think that um they um they're they're, they're looking for more contributions from a rank and file of our profession. And if you are so inclined, please contribute. Um, the question is, how did you conduct your initial research regarding difficult patients you saw in pra practice? Um, I would say the research was more uh, finding out what was written about this topic. And what was interesting is, so this, the paper that I allude to, and if, if you, it's called Taking Care of the Hateful Patient. It's from 1978. There's almost no literature uh, about, you know, it's a very taboo topic to, to even suggest that physicians don't like some of their patients, physicians and nurses. But here we are. Of course, we know that some of our patients <laughs> get on our very last nerve. Um, and, you know, all things being equal, we would rather they weren't there. Um, you know, we have this very exalted view of uh, physicians and nurses, rightly so. We do our best for everybody, but some people kind of get on our nerves. So uh, Dr. Groves wrote about it. Um, it's worth going back um, to the, uh, the, the original article if you want to read it. Um, it's, it's available through New England Journal of Medicine, but there also is, um, perhaps I can add this, um, there's somewhere you can get it through Washington University of St. Louis where you don't have to go through the paywall of the New England Journal. I don't know if that's kosher to say that. And um, it's worth looking at because it's very interesting. It talks a lot about, in, it's a psychiatrist's version. There's a lot of projection, a lot of psychiatric issues that are discussed. Um, and then the other research I did was um, about the, the literature that responded to that over the next 25 years because that article is from 1978. Um, Dr. Steinberg has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Nadorf. It, it really is wonderful. Um, I'm a PCOM 1976. I came to Ohio to do some training and stayed here. I have been very involved um, in professionalism in the state of Ohio and uh, beyond. Uh, my background is uh, I trained in pediatrics and family medicine and practiced family medicine for many, many years. And I served in medical staff leadership as well as served on the State Medical Board of Ohio for 25 years and have been an assistant dean at the Ohio University Com. Um, so I have 
you know, spent a good deal of time lecturing to medical students, medical staffs, um, leaders in uh, programs and so forth. And my question to you is in the areas of professionalism, because that's really where you are in, in your conversation about thinking how we think about difficult patients. And I think beyond that about how not only do we have difficulty with certain patients, but how do we train our students and residents and how do we continue to train each other responsibly so that um, one does not get in trouble uh, because of it. Uh, we, we do know that the relationship between the patient and physician, um, when it's a good one and a solid one, that we're less apt to see uh, patients uh, suing physicians. But beyond that, uh, there is this challenge to medical licensure if a patient should uh, uh, report you to a state medical board and so forth. And, and that happens in real life. And I, I see that all the time. So I'm wondering if you have spent time uh, lecturing to uh, residency programs, uh, medical staffs at their meetings, um, and other areas in, in the areas of professionalism, because your topic is such a wonderful one. Uh, yes, I have. And um, this dovetails into that completely, because what we find, um, and it's, you know, I talk a lot about this in, in the book, and I'd be, um, Pleased to come talk about it with your with students or residents, or virtually, which whichever way we do uh, in the coming year. Uh, that overreaction, um, because in a, we feel uh, in the moment we're talking to our patient, we so very much wish for them to be a good patient, but they turn out to be difficult in many of the ways. This challenges us so much, and of course, one of the we, we get emotional about it. This is. Um, we're only human, we get angry, and sometimes we um, answer back with anger. We say things that should have been left unsaid. We're not our best selves. I think we all know how, how we'd like to uh, interact with our patients under all circumstances with respect and calm. But um, again, you know, some people kind of worm their way into our uh, anger, get us really frustrated, and um, that kind of feeling of defeat. So. I discuss those issues and just the awareness, just awareness alone is such a, a huge tool because uh, when, when you know it's there and you're kind of expecting it, that you're going to get pushed back on something, um, it gives you a little bit of time to pause and say, ah, yes, this is where they're not going to take my advice. They're not going to do what I ask. I want them to be admitted, but they want to go home. And we're going to have to ask the questions, use some of the tools that I go over, put a little uh, pause before you answer with anger. And um, I think that we'll see much better results. Plus the fact, I think there'll be less complaining, less um, survey, bad surveys, less reports to the state medical uh, licensure authorities because this is a tremendous part of it our interactions with these people who are diff who we find difficult and um i think that um uh you're 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 right on the money it's part of professionalism and um, i mean there are many factors that are making it difficult on our colleagues who are in the trenches no question but this is a big one and um I think, um, you know, just like the title says, we can, there are things we can do to change the way we think about difficult patients because they're not going anywhere. The only thing that we can change is the way we think about them. Somebody mentioned it's so true. Um, yeah, I, I, in one of my lectures, I talk about that. I said, one of the rules of the house of God is the patient is the one with the disease. And like it or not, our patients have autonomy. Uh, this is one of the precepts of um, medical ethics and our ethical interaction uh, with the physician and the patient. Our patients have autonomy. They have the autonomy not to take our advice. Um, so we want our patients to be autonomous. We just want them to follow our advice. So um, we, we need to um, be prepared. It's not always going to happen the way we would like. And um, remember that 
sometimes there will be a negative outcome because they are they make an autonomous decision that was unwise. Dr. Nadorf. Yes. Uh, this is Kate Galuzzi. I'm the one who put the comment from House of God. Mm -hmm. And and um, it's wonderful to hear you speak. It's wonderful to see you. I'm and congratulations on the publication of your book. You. My my comment is is simply that, and I'm sure you allude to this in your book, that if we allow ourselves to manifest that anger and amplify that that annoyance and irritation that we feel about our patients, we can end up being the ones with the disease. So I think what Dr. Shem said was, you know, on the face of it, it's like, ha ha, yeah, the patient's the one with the disease. I'm not the sick one. But I think if we dive a little deeper, it's quite a profound statement. And we need to internalize that and remember that the reason that they may be acting like a jackass, <laughs> for lack of a better term, is, is because they are sick. And if we get angry and irritable with them, we can then ourselves become sick. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. I do talk about this sort of issue that one way to kind of change the way you think about your difficult patients is to view their symptoms. Now, some people definitely fall into this category. Some of their symptoms are just are a, a symptom of their disease. And if we view uh, some of their cantankerous behavior or you know, non-adherence to our plan in that way, um, it helps us be a little bit more compassionate. And just like we wouldn't be mad at someone because they have a low sodium, um, this is just another symptom or sign uh, of their illness. Um, and I agree with you. Uh, I also discuss this kind of when I'm wrapping things up, what you think really matters. And if you could kind of guide yourself to have more positive thoughts about your patients, you're gonna feel better because thinking negative thoughts and wishing they weren't there or it shouldn't be this way all the time makes you feel terrible. And um, who wants to feel terrible after a shift? I mean, we have enough problems, um, but you know, we can get ourselves to a better place on this um, issue. Um, there's one more question I want to just address. What about when you have drug-seeking patients? Would you consider them difficult? Absolutely. Um, this is a big problem. It's always been a big problem in the emergency department um, and in the, in the office, I'm sure. Um, in the office, maybe you uh, have people who are uh, who you know over a longer period of time. In the emergency department, we're, of course, seeing people for the first time, and we have no record. Um, there are the um, state reporting um, data banks now. So sometimes we do know if people have been traveling from emergency department to emergency department um, looking for prescriptions. But, you know, again, we have, they think they need that to feel better. Um, we know that uh, it's not what they need. Um, uh, so we can either limit what we make available if we're not sure that it, it's legitimate request for pain relief. Um, and we just have to kind of come to grips with the fact that not all of our patients are going to be happy with us. Um, and people who are um, drug seeking, and, and sometimes the drug seek, I'm not even talking about, you know, may not even be uh, pain relievers. A lot of people out there who are seeking antibiotic prescriptions for their viral infection. And, you know, the, the right thing to do is to not give it to them. But of course, we see that a lot of people do. And I understand why. And I'm not going to say tell you that I've never done it. But um, you have to know where you stand on that issue and be able and like your reasons. We've got uh, time for one more question, Dr. Nadorf. I think there's one up on the board. Two up, two up now. Um, oh, goodness gracious. Someone said they remember me as a resident. That is so great. Um, uh, what was the, the, the question was, how should we keep a positive attitude when yeah. dealing with these patients? Well, <clears throat> there, there are a few things. And I, I, first of all, we have to remember that they think that they need it and, and there are other reasons. Um, so at least we can be more compassionate for them. Um, I just read 
a shirt. I love Rana Otwish's book, In Shock. Should be standard curriculum at all the medical schools. A few pages of her book, she talks about what it was like when she tried to break her pain reliever uh, dependence. Um, that insight will give you a lot of um, more compassion towards some of these patients. Um, you have to have confidence. The, the answer to this question is you have to be confident in your approach that you've done everything you can to help them, offer them other sorts of pain relievers, um, and uh, you have to be confident that and have your own back that you're doing the right thing because there are going to be some people who are uh, leave the department who are annoyed with you. You can't make everybody happy. Um, and uh, I, I know our administrators want us to do that, but that would be doing the wrong thing for some people. So I think um, working on your own confidence and having your own back is the answer to that question. Because you, you know we don't want to just slap a happy thought on, oh, I love dealing with drug addicts. Of course, we do not. But um, they exist, they have problems. Uh, I think I try to view every person as someone's son or daughter or mother and that allows me to have a lot more compassion for them because um, I know what it feels like to be, you know, someone's daughter or mother. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Nader. This has been really enlightening and informative. And uh, I love all the questions that, that I got fielded to you. So that I also thank the audience for your participation as well. So uh, I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dr. Nader, and we wish you the best. And thank you for appearing on PCM Library's author series. It was a pleasure. I hope uh, everybody got something out of it. And if you want to have a look at my website and read some other things, that would be so fun. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.